Today we are reading from Nebuchadnezzar, um, Canto 10, Chapter 3, Verse 45. And um, I'll read the verse and the purport in the translation first, and then we shall get into it. <clears throat> So the verse says, <clears throat> Vamam putra bhavena, Brahma bhavena chasa krit, Chintayanto krito sneho, Yasyate madgatim param. And I'll just read the translation and the purport. I'm sharing my screen here for those that want to read along. And so this is um, Krishna speaking, appearing from Devaki's womb. And he is saying to Devaki and Vasudev, both of you, husband and wife, constantly think of me as your son, but always know that I am the supreme personality of Godhead. By thus thinking of me constantly with love and affection, you will achieve the highest perfection, returning home back to Godhead. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. This instruction by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to His father and mother, who are eternally connected with Him, is especially intended for persons eager to return home back to Godhead. One should never think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as an ordinary human being, as non-devotees do. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, personally appeared and left his instructions for the benefit of all human society. But fools and rascals, unfortunately, think of him as an ordinary human being and twist the instructions of Bhagavad Gita for the satisfaction of their senses. Practically, everyone commenting on Bhagavad Gita interprets it for sense gratification. It has become especially fashionable for modern scholars and politicians to interpret Bhagavad Gita as if it were something fictitious. And by their wrong interpretations, they are spoiling their own careers and the careers of others. The Krishna consciousness movement, however, is fighting against this principle of regarding Krishna as a fictitious person and of accepting that there was no battle of Kurukshetra, that everything is symbolic and that nothing in Bhagavad Gita is true. In any case, if one truly wants to be successful, one can do so by reading the text of Bhagavad Gita as it is. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially stressed the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, Yare Deka Tarekaha Krishna Upadesha. If one wants to achieve the highest success in life, one must accept Bhagavad Gita as spoken by the Supreme Lord. By accepting Bhagavad Gita in this way, all of human society can become perfect and happy. It is to be noted that because Vasudeva and Devaki would be separated from Krishna when he was carried to Gokul, the residence of Nanda Maharaj, the Lord personally instructed them that they should always think of him as their son and as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That would keep them in touch with him. After 11 years, the Lord would return to Mathura to be their son, and therefore there was no question of separation. Hmm. Jai. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuru Nilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam 
Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Gurun Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Stam Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raguna Tambitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Stam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kantam Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyayvacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatyade Shatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So first and foremost um I want to thank all of you for being here and I would like to ask for um, forgiveness. I'm not as prepared as I usually am today and um, I haven't been feeling so well for about a week and um, yesterday was kind of the first day I was feeling a bit better and then it went south again and um, so I've been really meditating on just not being in control and um, trying to focus on that a little bit. And it's actually quite nice, um, especially for this verse uh, that we're covering because I'm someone that likes to be extra prepared. And I am someone that likes things to be very perfect. And of course, this is a good thing because um, our offerings to Krishna and to Guru should be nice. Um, However, something, one of the themes that I'd like to talk about today in this beautiful verse and this purpose, there's a couple of themes, there's so many ways that um, one can go with this purport, Prabhupada is saying so many wonderful things here. Um, but one of the th words that came to my mind um, are intention, the intention, or what are our intentions, and also really having in mind the goal um, in the purport show, Prabhupada first and foremost is talking about eagerness to return back home, back to Godhead. And uh, I'll talk about that more, but sometimes that eagerness can get a little um, jaded, for lack of a better word. And specifically, um, intention, right? If my intention is to give a perfect class with perfect um you know notes and perfect i know all the verses and this connects to this verse and this connects to that verse and this it's all connecting um and if my intention is just to give that perfect class because i want to seem grandiose or like i know my stuff <laughs> then, this, then then we're missing the point actually hmm? Yes, we're missing the point. And this is actually a very fundamental um, aspect of our philosophy. It's a very fundamental aspect of Krishna consciousness to understand um, 
the, the, the intention and the heart of when I am doing something, anything actually, right? Anything. Um, and so here in the purport, um, the way that Prabhupada specifically is talking about this theme is that he's speaking about Krishna and how he appeared in this world in his form, original form, and how he left the, his instructions for all of humanity, right? For the benefit of all of humanity here in the purport, Prabhupada is saying, but fools and rascals, I love when Prabhupada says that, but fools and rascals unfortunately think of him as an ordinary human being and twist the instructions of Bhagavad Gita for the satisfaction of their senses. And he goes on and on in the purport we've already read um, to say how so many of these translations of Bhagavad Gita are actually um, nonsense, for lack of a better word, because they are um, pretending and they are making the case that all of this is a, a metaphor, an allegory, that the battle of Kurukshetra did not happen, that it's all fictitious. Hmm? And so it um, not only is depending on how we are, well, it's depending on how we are approaching this Bhagavad Gita, right? When we are reading Bhagavad Gita, and this is interesting because for us as devotees uh, or as, as people who are trying to be devotees, this, this, instruction might not seem so um like like we're probably thinking like yeah i know i know krishna is speaking to arjuna and i know that the battle of kurukshetra happened and i get it but i think this is a really important instruction um you know the bhakti center we're at the bhakti well i'm not at the bhakti center but we're all at the bhakti center bhakti center um is majorly a preaching program and we're speaking to people and we're speaking to a lot of new people about Bhagavad Gita. Um, and I've had many occasions and many times in my preaching where people have come to me and say, I want to read Bhagavad Gita and I have this translation by so-and-so. And I always have to find a nice way to say no. Fools and rascals. No. Fools and rascals. <laughs> Do not read this translation. However, I cannot say this. I can't say, no, don't, you know. And so I have to find a very nice way of, of saying it. Or I'll encounter people who have read, I'm putting this in quotation marks, who have read the Bhagavad Gita before, but it's in some Mayavadi um, translation and they have some strange ideas about it. And I have to go about it in some interesting way. Mm, but let's talk about um, let's talk about this here. I wanted to mention this. So Krishna is leaving behind his instructions. Things are very clear in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, when we are preaching to others, we have to be careful in how we are presenting things, especially if they have been exposed to different translations of Bhagavad Gita, and etc. But there's a deeper instruction here. There's a deeper instruction here, and the instruction is. Uh, an instruction that Krishna, Sri Krishna himself gives in Bhagavad Gita, Yeyatam Mam Prapadyante Tams Tataiva Pajamiham, which is, as you approach me, hmm, I will reciprocate accordingly. And so the instruction really is how we are approaching our spiritual life, how we are approaching our day to day life, our moment to moment life, right? Because uh, actually, we can't be hmm, uh, compartmentalizing our spiritual life. Over here is my spiritual life and over here is my material life. That's not really how it works. And so in our everyday today moment of life, Krishna can be present if we want him to be present. If we are seeing Krishna in everything. Yes, beautiful verse in Bhagavad Gita also for one who sees me in everything and everyone, he is never lost to me, nor am I ever, ever lost to him, right? Something like that, the English translation. It's a very beautiful verse. However, this is a very high level of, um, of, of seeing, right? To see Krishna in everything, to see Krishna in everyone. And I really, really, really think that it's a 
it's a practice and it's really important to be aware as people who are practicing bhakti and trying to be sincere devotees it's really important to be aware where we are at and be honest with ourselves where am i in my sadhana where am i in my bhajan where am i in my japa where am i in my kirtan am i focusing on the material aspects am i turning it into a rote um, ritualistic um, automatic process or am I actually approaching these practices that have been given to us in a sincere way and I'm not speaking I'm not speaking in any sort of critical way I'm speaking for myself yes I like to use I statements I I sometimes have approached um, my sadhana in this way right where the mantras just turn into you're kind of just chanting along chanting along walking on the street, chanting along, chanting in the subway. And it's good because we're chanting Krishna's name and of course Krishna is there. But what is my intention in this chanting? That's really what's being asked of us. Like, what is my intention in this chanting? Am I really going deep? And I'll go back to this point, but the, the way that Prabhupada starts this purport is that this instruction to Devaki and Vasudev is, is for those devotees who are eager who are eager to return back home, back to Godhead. And so this intention of how we are approaching our sadhana and how we're approaching our Krishna consciousness in general really speaks to, it's connected to my level of eagerness or lack thereof. And so there's, it's a little, it's a little confrontational, but I think some confrontation is good sometimes in our spiritual life, in our Krishna consciousness. And so we have to remember that, that Krishna will reciprocate accordingly to how we approach him. So if we are approaching Krishna half-heartedly, that's how we'll be approached, half-heartedly. If we're approaching Krishna in a rote, ritualistic way, then that's also how we will be reciprocated with. So it's almost kind of empowering in a sense, because we're in the driver's seat a little bit. Like we we are in charge of making those day-to-day -day choices of how much I am wanting or courageous enough, because it does take some courage, courageous enough to surrender, right? We have to remember that at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna made all types of excuses um, to not fight. And he made all types of arguments to not fight. And uh, Krishna, you know, was kind of listening and this and et cetera. And uh, the real instruction of Bhagavad Gita didn't begin until um, Arjuna wholeheartedly and sincerely said to Krishna, I surrender, right? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Actually, my heart is confused. Hmm? Actually, I've lost all composure and, and I'm surrendering to you as, as a student, as a disciple, right? Please instruct me. And then Krishna kind of smiled a little bit, right? That's what we read. And the reason is because he understood now, Krishna knows now that now the instruction could begin because Arjuna has surrendered. Hmm? And so, yes, we must surrender. And uh, it takes some courage and it's hard. <laughs> I'm speaking from personal experience. It's quite hard to do. Um, but it's also very important to know, to kind of just be mindful and, and conscious of where we're at, right? Sri Prabhupada would say that before becoming, before becoming Krishna conscious, we have to become just conscious. And so it's really important to be conscious of where we are and and real with ourselves a little bit you know i was i was meditating on on this that in the bhakti center we have these india pilgrimages that we do and it's usually a mix of people but most of the time it's a lot of newer people uh, maybe people who've been practicing bhakti for some time but um in general it's a lot of newer people and i was meditating on the fact of how um 
we only we end in Vrindavan and we only are in Vrindavan for like two days. And the reason why we do this is because for those that have been to Vrindavan Dam, materialistically on the material, if, if we're looking at it through that lens, it can be a little bit austere or assaulting to the senses. And for people who are not properly situated in understanding that this Dam is so beautiful and so special, um, we don't want people making offenses to the Holy Dam, right? We don't want people getting, um, seeing the Holy Dam in a materialistic uh, vantage point. And therefore we plan, okay, only, only a few days for, for these uh, sincere souls who are coming because we don't want them to get um, overwhelmed. I'd like to read something. So this is going in line with my, um, uh, my desire or my, what's the word I'm looking for? my opening statement of not being too complicated and having a million verses to reference to, because I, I tend to be like that. I like to connect things and uh, my mind is sometimes, you know, you see those like funny maps where you're connecting all the red dots and like this kind of thing. Like my mind sometimes is like that. And I've learned that, you know, I've, I've really been this past week, um, Doyal and I and Achita Gopi, we do a podcast for the Bhakti Center at 9 a.m. And we've been talking a lot about simplicity and um, bhakti, I feel like, is simultaneously complex and simple, and the complexities are super cool, like going into all the verses and going into all the philosophy, it's very, very cool, but also, the simplicity is also very cool, I'm just going to say it like that. <laughs> so I was reading from The Journey Within by His Holiness Radhanath Swami, and I very much liked how he put it because it made it so simple about this point about um, intention and how we are approaching things um, in life. And so I'll read from this. Um, if you have the book, it's page 111. And it's just like a paragraph. So like this. So here we go. Srila Radhanath Swami is saying, Bhakti Yoga teaches that the dharma of every living being is seva, or loving service. This means that loving service is the essential nature of the soul, as we know. Practicing bhakti yoga is about honoring the soul's dharma and focusing on transforming material actions into spiritual ones. So we're getting into it now. Imagine two people studying or cooking or paying bills or painting. One person is acting in harmony with the true self, trying to please God, and the other for some selfish material purpose. From the outside, the results may appear to be the same, but these two set of actions are actually generating different outcomes. One person is becoming progressively free from the pull of matter on the path to liberation, and the other is showing, is sowing mm, the karmic seeds of his or her bondage to temporary pleasures and pains. What determines whether an action is spiritual or material? The consciousness or intention behind it. For example, a knife is good in the hands of a surgeon and bad in the hands of a murderer. Morphine is good in the hands of a hospice nurse and bad in the hands of a drug dealer. Everything in the material nature can be used for good or bad or in a higher sense for spiritual growth or material entanglement. And we choose how to use things based on what we want to gain from life. I'll read that last sentence again, because I think it's the most important. Everything in the material nature can be used for good or bad, or in a higher sense for spiritual growth or material entanglement. 
and we choose how to use things based on what we want to gain from life. Hmm. So this principle that I've been skating around, uh, some of you have heard of this principle. Uh, it's called Yukta Vairagya. Yeah? And this principle is the principle that Radhanath Swami is saying, that everything in this material nature can be used for good or bad. Or I really, really appreciate how he puts it. Um, um, in, a, in a more spiritual sense of, of spiritually elevating us or further entangling us in the material nature, right? I really like that way of putting it instead of good or bad, right? Because a lot of people get caught up in, in good or bad and good and bad can really start to, it, it, it helps us compartmentalize things and you know, the, it helps the mind kind of put things into boxes. So this concept of yukta vairagya or of um, using uh, material things in the service of Krishna is a topic that I won't go into so much because it's a big one. However, one thing that I will say, and Srila Prabhupada mentions this in the purport, is that um, spiritual things can be approached in a material way and therefore be used for harm. Hmm? And this has been done with Bhagavad Gita, right? There have been many people in history who have used statements out of context from Bhagavad Gita to justify their um, insanity, for lack of a better word, yes? And so, really, this idea of utilizing everything in the material um, atmosphere in service to Krishna it's not, it shouldn't be done whimsically um, based on one's own kind of ideations, right? It's not just me here, you know, Kishore Chandra Das. You know, you know, I just want to use all these things for Krishna service and I'm just going to do it. Yay, you know, because I'm understanding that um, <laughs> I'm understanding that actually I'm um, my level of qualification is not so high and therefore I should be taking some instruction on how to do this as opposed to just thinking that I know it all and now I can just use this where is it where is my device this is the hardest one in my opinion I'm just gonna use this phone in Krishna service look I have I have Krishna Balaram I'm using this phone in Krishna service only only in Krishna service. It's Yukta Vairagya. Yes. And so <laughs> it doesn't work that way, as we all know. And this kind of blanket um, thinking can uh, lead to problems, right? Oh, I use all this money in Krishna service. I use this Mercedes Benz in Krishna service. I'm using uh, this um, whatever, right? All these kinds of things in Krishna service. And that's not to be said that they can't be used in Krishna service. However, I remember one of the first Bhagavatam classes I gave a long time ago. I gave this, I, I spoke about this topic um, briefly, and now I'm speaking about it again briefly. But I really like, uh, this is in chapter 9 of Bhagavad Gita. This is verse 28. And I won't read the verse, um, but Srila Prabhupada is speaking about yukta vairagya in the purport and he defines it and he says one who acts in krishna consciousness under superior direction is called yukta the technical term is yukta vairagya this is further explained by rupa goswami as follows and then he explains the you know, performing um, actions and connection to krishna etc but this super important point that Srila Prabhupada hits upon, that the person who is acting in Krishna consciousness under superior direction, that is the, the yukta, who can then do the vairagya, right? 
And so this is very important because it is, and I'll wrap up here because I feel like I've gone in so many different points and I have so many other points to make, but I'm just going to try to keep things simple instead of being so complicated. Um, this is really important because going back to the beginning, we've been talking about intentions. And so the intention in my heart, how am I approaching this service? How am I approaching my study of Shastra? Am I doing it so that I can memorize a bunch of verses and then feel good about myself because I'm better than all of you, right? There's, that's a problem, right? And then that's not, the, the intention is not quite there. That's not correct. Because the most important thing about intention is that the intention is leading me somewhere. The intention is leading me somewhere. And I, I feel like a lot of the times, and again, I'm speaking for myself. A lot of the times I, I forget, right? I forget what the actual goal of this Krishna consciousness is because the material nature is so, um, you know, arresting. And we just become tied up in our day-to-day -day rhythmic, you know, movements. And so Srila Prabhupada is saying very clearly here again at the beginning of the purport, and I'll tie it back to this and then we'll open up for questions. Srila Prabhupada is saying this instruction that Devaki and Vasudeva are receiving from Krishna is, um, is especially intended for persons eager to return home back to Godhead. And this eagerness this eagerness is something that um, it needs to be protected, actually. It needs to be, if we've, if we've lost that eagerness, we need to associate with those that have that eagerness in their heart. You know, this is something, um, Doyal yesterday, was it yesterday? Doyal yesterday was giving a class and he was speaking about the Bhakti Lata Bij, this beautiful seed of Bhakti that needs to be protected, actually. And so if we're noticing any any sense of nihilism or any sense of jadedness or any sense of kind of just you know blahness oh whatever you know i'm just chanting my rounds i'm just doing my thing I'm just yeah i'm just reading the gita you know if we're sensing any of that it needs to be addressed kind of immediately um and 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 not that someone external to you should be like mah, mah, mah. why aren't you doing like this it's more of an internal addressing of how is my heart, right? How am I approaching my Japa, Kirtan, Shastra study, right? It, am I just going through the motions of, of, the, of the, you know, uh, kind of Krishna conscious devotee like role? Am I just going through the motions? Or am I actually, um, and this is a whole topic that we could speak up that I, that I won't go into, but the relationship with Krishna, Sambandha, right? This is the most important thing. My relationship with Krishna, am I actually fostering a relationship with Krishna? Am I actually understanding who Krishna is, what Krishna likes, what Krishna's instructions are? Hmm? Am I actually um, approaching it in this very personal way or am I not? And this is a very nice litmus test uh, for us to do about our eagerness. And again, uh, and I'll end here because we have 10 minutes for questions. This isn't a exercise to make ourselves feel like bad or guilty if I'm not showing up in my Krishna consciousness in this way. Because if we are starting to feel bad or guilty, then that again is kind of just like, what was me, ego, like, oh, look at me, you know, this and this. It's more about like, just being real with ourselves, just being honest with where we're at. You know, Srila Prabhupada always used kind of this language of being properly situated, being properly situated. And so really understanding like, hey, I'm a conditioned soul in this material situation and this material stuff is getting to me, you know? Let me take my little litmus test that we have to see like, how am I approaching my sadhana? How am I approaching my guru's instructions? How am I approaching um, the, the practices? And, and just being very honest and real with ourselves will help us kind of refocus our attention so that our Krishna consciousness doesn't, I mean, Radhanath Swami gives very kind of dramatic examples like the knife in the hands of a chef or in the hands of a murderer, right? So maybe we don't need to be that dramatic, but we don't want 
our um, knife of Krishna consciousness to become dull. We don't want it to just be, you know, kind of uh, useless, right? It needs to cut through the material atmosphere. It needs to cut through this illusion. We need to be able to use it um, and utilize it because it's supposed to take us somewhere. And I think that that's something that we forget, you know, that it's supposed to take us somewhere. There's supposed to be progress on this path. And so I'm, I'm gonna stop there because I could go on and on and on about this topic. Um, and we'll open up for questions. I wasn't looking at the chat the whole time because I didn't want to get distracted, but uh, let's, let's read the chat. Let's see. So Angelica is saying, thank you for sharing how you want to do the best for your Guru Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for saying that. Um, keeping your intention of pleasing them steady while also humbly accepting the challenges you're currently going through and still finding ways to serve in your unique situation. Thank you, Angelica. Andrea asks, uh-oh, here we go. Would love to hear your thoughts on how to speak to those who have read Srila Prabhupada's Gita and all they got were all the controversial points. <laughs> I'm sure you know which I speak of. How do we speak to those responses? Mm, okay, I'm going to put a pin in that because I, I have a little bit of a response to that, but I just want to read what Angelica is saying. She says, I really appreciate the shift between good and bad into what is elevating me spiritually and what is taking me away from Krishna slash disturbing my senses. Yes, me too. This way, we are also reminded of our ultimate goal of developing love for the Lord and can invite nuance into each one of our individual lives. There are general instructions that we are asked to follow and a unique way through which each one of us can develop and deepen our attachment to the name form, qualities, and pastimes of the Lord. That's so beautiful, Angelica. Yes, thank you so much. To Andrea's point about what do we do with, um, or how do we approach uh, those who have read Srila Prabhupada's Gita and all they got were the controversial points. Uh, Bhima says, sounds like a purport above. Perfect, it does, right? Angelica has such a beautiful way of writing. Um, I'll give a very general response to Andrea because there are so many controversial points in um, Bhagavad Gita, especially in Srila Prabhupada. I was actually, I won't bring this up, but I was, read, I was reading Chaitanya Charitamrita yesterday and I found a purport by Srila Prabhupada that was really out there and I sent it to my partner. I was like, um, do you see? That? It was so funny. Um, but it was really interesting because what my partner said, and I won't speak about the specific purport, but what he said was, we have to understand that actually what Srila Prabhupada is saying is true. And, and he is speaking perhaps from a very idealistic point of view in a what should be a perfect society. And so there's that understanding of like, hey, this is how it should be ideally. You know, ideally it should be like this. Or sometimes Sri Prabhupada will speak like worst case scenario. He also speaks like this sometimes. Worst case can scenario, you know, these things need to be done. But we have to remember that Sri Prabhupada also was very um, personal in his instruction. And um, I think the question is specifically to those reading Bhagavad Gita as it is. <sighs> It's hard for me to give a response to this because there's not a specificity in what the point is, but I will say two things. One, if someone comes across Bhagavad Gita and is reading it on their own without superior direction as um, noted, then it might cause some rumblings in the heart. It might cause certain things and it might go over their head. I actually had that experience. I met the devotees when I was 21 and I was living in India and I went to my first Discon temple in Bangalore and they gave me a japa bag and Maha Prasad and Kirtan and Bhagavad Gita. They were really intense. Um, I didn't know at the time, but it was a Ritvik temple. Um, so they were really intense. They like really wanted to get me. And, um, and uh, I read the Bhagavad Gita by myself and I read all of the purports by myself. And it really, really just like kind of went over my head. I was like, okay, this seems like a little out there. Like, I don't know what to make of this. And, and um, thankfully Krishna had a plan for me and somehow or another, I was, I was pulled back. Um, but I really think that there's, there's um, 
I don't think that anything should ever be done in a, I always, in, in a contentious way, if that makes sense. I don't think anything should ever be, at least this is my style. I don't think anything should ever be done, especially with people that are being very contentious. Like, no, but look, Prabhupada is saying this and this is wrong. And how could he be saying like this? Oh, this and this and this and this, et cetera. I remember once, I was in a community group. It was one of my very first community groups in 2016 uh, with Veer Bhadra and Arjuna Prabhu. I don't know if Arjuna Prabhu is listening. And I remember we were reading a book by Bhakti Tirta Swami and he said something very, um, now I see as correct, but in the moment I thought was very not okay. And um, I got very upset. And I felt very contentious and I felt very, um, it was a controversial point as Andrea has put. Um, and I, I was, yeah, I was like almost ready to walk out of there. And actually Arjuna Prabhu was the one who pacified me. And the way that he pacified me was not with logic and it wasn't with um, like pointing to a million verses. It was with love and affection. It was with kindness. It was with telling me what I needed to hear in the moment to help me soothe the situation and not necessarily trying to prove Bhakti Tirta Swami's point to me. You know, I don't like in retrospect, if, if that's what would have been tried, it probably wouldn't have worked. And rather, the angle that worked was loving kindness and and just um being there for me you know and here i am bima prabhu please i think haribo prabhu very very astute class and uh thank you for taking on that um a, a very difficult subject matter about controversial controversial issues um i find for myself um that uh, if we just remember the essential message of Srila Prabhupada, which is that we have to, on two points here, one, let's say orientation, our physical orientation, and two is our, um, our gender, uh, you know, so to speak, the, some of the controversial statements that Prabhupada made. And on those two points alone, uh, being probably first and foremost at the front, of uh, things that people have problem with is that if one understands the essential message, and that is that we're supposed to be attracted, oriented towards Krishna alone. How do you say it? Yeah, yeah, no other. Um, and uh, as far as understanding the essential message, that um, it is the female devotees, uh, uh, it is the representatives of the feminine energy in Golok Vrindavan, whether it be the gopis themselves or his mother Yashoda or the Brahmins' wives, they are all the highest. It is always the men, if you noticed, including Brahma himself, that are always screwing things up. So if we just leap over and look at things as Krishna looks at them, that it's actually... <laughs> a woman's nature to be more intelligent because she can more easily be intuitively, instinctively attracted to Krishna, that men have to give up their Purusha status before they are even allowed to even think of the Rasa dance. Mm -hmm. And that in regards to orientation, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that we're all Pakriti. So if we understand that we are uh, 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 very simple, attracted to Krishna, and that the highest service is conjugal ras. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Radhanath Maharaj once said, when we were asking about <clears throat> the different rasas and are they higher and stuff like that. He said, we have to understand that in Golok Vrindavan, Madura ras tinges all the relationships with Krishna. Madura ras is always there. Everybody's always thinking on that level of absolute surrender and in love, not just loving Krishna, but in love with Krishna. So uh, with that being said, it becomes very easy to push away the Dharma, which Krishna says we have to surrender, 
push away the dharma of this world, the dharma of religion. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Mm. If a little boy doesn't have to think of how he's going to get to his girlfriend, Prabhupada said, or how he's going to treat his girlfriend. He doesn't say, well, if I do this, this he just does. He goes, gets the flowers. He go, he says sweet things. He's constantly thinking of her naturally. Mm. Um, Prabhupada said that we should think of Krishna as a, as a, uh, as a girl thinks uh, of, uh, uh, an attractive girl thinks of an attractive boy. It mm-hmm. becomes instinctual. So mm-hmm. Hare Krishna, I didn't mean to ramble on there, but it no, is no, no, actually I, a simple thing. I really appreciate your point, Bhima Prabhu. And, and, and it's such a, I love how deep you went. You know, it's such a beautiful understanding for us as those that are trying to be devotees. And the only thing that I will add to that is to, to Andrea's question is just going back to this point that I was making throughout the entire class of, of, we we probably can't speak like that to people who are being contestative. I don't know if that's a word for people that are being contentious and asking all these questions, right? We can talk like that to devotees, but people who might not know those things, most people, I mean, I'll, I'll just be quite real. Most people um, are not like super philosophically oriented. Like most people are not like going in and being like, wait, but this and this, and you know, right? Most people, they just will have some issue. Right? They'll just have some issue with the woman thing or with the sexuality thing or with the gender thing. They'll just have like some sort of social issue around it. And I think that it's just really important to understand. And Srila Prabhupada was an expert at this, of understanding time, place, and circumstance and understanding who we are speaking to and how we should speak to them. And therefore, it's hard to give a specific answer to a general question. For us as devotees, we can understand, yes, the highest um, that th- those that were the highest in Vrindavan were, were the gopis and the Brahmin's wife and Mother Yashoda and et cetera. And we mm-hmm. should be thinking of Krishna just as the gopi. You know, we, we can understand that. But for someone who has just read Bhagavad Gita, maybe they stumbled across it and they were like, wait a minute, Srila Prabhupada is saying this about women. We might not be able to speak to them like that. And I think my only addition, yeah, my only contribution to that would, sometimes you just need to hear people out and let them say what they got to say. You know, sometimes, you just, and, and just, kind of take it a little bit, you know, you just need to look, okay, yes, you know, oh, you know, w- women's issues, okay, or like whatever, you know, LGBT issues or uh, race issues, like, you know, you need to just kind of like hear them out a little bit and let them get it out. Because if we go to them, this has been my experience as well, both on a personal level, being on the receiving end, and also on the on the preaching end of just, you know, if we go to people like, you're not this body, and you know, you're just making this up or whatever. And I'm not saying that you're saying that, Bhima Prabhu. I'm just saying that um, I, I think that Srila Prabhupada was an expert at, at not doing this um, when it came to, to dealing with devotees. He acted in a very personal way and um, he adjusted things accordingly to uh, different of his disciples. Uh, point well taken, Prabhu. I, I totally, uh, I, I'm here. I am speaking as devotees because even as devotees uh, established in the movement, we stumble across across those same. Um, I mean, I, I still uh, flinch when I come up. Women are less intelligent. I flinch, but then I immediately remember uh, what is really underneath that all. Uh, women are less intelligent because <laughs> they want because <laughs> they're willing to put up with men is the problem. Um, the, uh, uh, so it, it is true. Uh, but I feel that if the devotee themselves understand uh, that, that thing that we can lovingly address that person, and like you said, with patience, uh, hearing them out, allowing them to speak, and um, perhaps uh, uh, do, uh, um, pointing them towards the more... Um, essential message mm. of uh the beauty of krishna uh how could god not be the most beautiful the, the reason why we're talking about attractions on any level in this world is that all attractions mm. in this world because of the temporary nature of the body etc are mm. perverted all attractions are perverted mm. even between a man and a woman in this world if you're attracted to that i mean how many how many uh pastimes do we have to talk about Janaka Pandit, et cetera, talking about uh, the, the woman, you know, bringing, I think you know the one, bringing the buckets of her uh, 
uh, her body to the person who the, the, the devotee that or uh, the man who was in love with her saying, this is what you're in love with, you know, yeah. so to speak. So all things in this world are perverted. Yeah. So, you know, with a couple of words and uh, the essential message of uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, movement is to develop love of Krishna on these higher levels. And I think that will resonate deeply because everybody's looking for love. Yes. So thank you very much, Prabhu. I, I, I really enjoy your class. Hare thank Krishna. Hare Krishna. Andrea. Hare Krishna, Kishore Chandra Prabhu. I just wanted to quickly, because I have to run, but I just wanted to thank you for taking my question. I know it's it's a very difficult question. And like I said, and I, and I made it general on purpose, just because I, I've actually had people hit all the points. And I actually had a person recently that hit all the points. And I was just like, okay, can't even address like one. So I, I really appreciate how you answered it. And just to reflect back, what I heard you really say is to just take that radical personalism view of it, to take compassion, to really be with them and be present mm -hmm. and to step back. And instead of trying to be in a right or wrong, just be, in, just be with them wherever they are and just let them kind of be with them and make sure that they feel heard and then once that is all there, and depending on the time, place, and circumstance, and if the relationship is there, and if they do feel that, then you can kind of see based on what they say, how you can address it with some of that philosophy in mind that Bhima, you know, mentioned some of the other things that we know. But so that's what I heard. I just want to make sure that I heard correctly before I go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I said, radical personalism. And one, one addendum I'll add to that is never be afraid to make a reference, you know, not like in, in, a, in, in Shastra, but like to refer someone to someone else. Mm, okay. I've, always, I've always felt like if people are asking way too many questions and they're way too like, they just want to know all the verses and all the philosophy yeah. and where, I'm just like, you know what, go talk to, go talk to Jai Jagannath. You know, I'm going to send you to Jai Jagannath and he can give you exactly where in CC and blah and et cetera. And mm -hmm. there have been people like that that have approached me. And I'm like, actually, I don't know. So you can go yeah. talk to this person and I trust that they will tell you. And it's yeah. gone well, you know? And so I think accepting what I do know and what I can mm -hmm. offer mm -hmm. and accepting what I don't know and what I can't offer is also very important. That's that's super helpful. Because I actually have some done something of that before version of it, like being like, I think if you went and listened to lectures of Rukmini Prabhu or some of the female disciples of Prabhupada, you can get a sense or refer them to the book that Jai uh, read from, you know, yesterday that talks about all the experiences of the female disciples. So, so yeah. Okay, great. So that's kind of like where I was going. So thank you so much. I, I have to run, but I really wanted to take the moment to thank you because it wasn't an easy question and I'm so grateful you answered it. Thank you. Thank you. Angelica. Hi, Krishna. I, I do want to add to this point specifically because uh, of course it was so hard for me to hear that at first and then I was doing my own research and listening to other speakers um, and like many things that come up is the fact that sometimes even Shia Prabhupada uses um, words with perfect meaning but the meaning that sometimes we actually overlook in even like regular speech and even in the in the way of saying intelligent I remember a few lectures pointing out that in that circumstance, he points out to the notion of intelligence versus emotional reactions. And it's like in that way, it's even proven scientifically that it's like if a woman becomes a mother, like her hysterical side slash amygdala of the brain like swells, which means that like she actually is really emotionally moved because she loves her child this much. And so in this way, it's like, yes, women are are more emotionally maybe at times. And of course that's a generalization, um, but they tend to be more emotional, which then points out that it's in quotes, less intelligence. Mm. Um, and then also that's Shia Prabhupada, we need to take it into context. And even in in other places, he speaks about marriage and, and this proper Varnashra and Dharma and, and proper family systems. And in that way, it's uh, it he was pointing out in his other purpose how important it is that women are protected and that um, maybe not they are not dependent but they actually feel um, that they can rely on their husbands for for safety and for um, strong support mm -hmm. um, and also it's what I find helps me in, in um, 
going through those difficult um, or, or maybe controversial or just emotion steering purpose is to even stop myself and say, okay, I'm reading this right now, but actually I know what Shri Prabhupada said in many other places, which actually contradicts even if I was to take that as a granted. Mm -hmm. Like if I was to even believe like Shri Prabhupada claims that women are less intelligent, then why would he encourage his female disciples to give Bhagavatam classes or to start temples? And why would he even empower them that much and trust them um, and even tell them like, yes, lead your husband if he claimed that they are less intelligent. Like that is just a controversy and, and, and uh, it contradicts one another and it cannot be that um, he can do one thing and then even say this thing and, and believe in it. Mm -hmm. um, which then lets me to just dig deeper into what can be the meaning under it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just what I would like to share a few cents of mine um, from my own struggles with this. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, Angelika. And I'll just add to that, that it really connects back to what we've been talking about this whole time about kind of like Angelika is saying, going deeper beyond the surface level and really getting to the heart of the matter, right? So it's really the intention in the heart that matters more than the surface level. If I'm, if I'm focused on the surface material aspects, um, then I won't get the heart of the meaning. So if I'm approaching Bhagavad Gita already with a um, uh, contentious, challenging, you know, why is it like this? And why is it like this? And, you know, if I'm already approaching it in this way, then this is how I'm going to receive it. You know, if I'm approaching it with a sincere heart and then like Angelika will be able to go deep. What, what does this actually mean? You know, and what was Srila Prabhupada actually saying? Let me look into this. Yes, Bhima Prabhu. I just wanted to, what Angelika said um, and what you're saying, um, first of all, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, applaud you for the idea of that radical person, bringing that up. We, that it's a, just such a great phrase because if we are present in, with that person, in the here and now, and, and uh, as been said before, a guru, which we all should be, so to speak, at the time of answering the question, um, goes to the person, uh, does not bring the person to them. He, the, the guru meets them where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, so being there in the moment and actually listening, and also what you said, which is a form of humility, referring them onward to someone that could perhaps speak uh, more poignantly uh, to an issue. And in, in regards to issues, we also have to remember <clears throat> uh, that we shouldn't, uh, when we say uh, intellectually um, versus emotionally, we have to understand that it, it, even if a woman is more emotional, that is actually a good thing if it can be dovetailed in the service of Krishna uh, in their devotion. Devotion uh, is emotional. Bhav is emotional. Ras is instinctively emotional. It is not intellectual. It was Arjun's intellectuality which had him hesitate. It was the Brahmins themselves when asked simply for Prashad for Krishna. It was their intellectualism, their ritualism that got in the way, but it was the wives who emotionally had an attachment for Krishna. So we, when we say it, less intelligence, the intelligence, the intellect, is actually in this world a barrier to uh, true realization of Krishna. So uh, we should always remember that emotional uh, is being emotional only has to be um, mm -hmm. redirected. Mm. Thank you so Hare much. Krishna. Yes, that's such a beautiful point. I agree 100%. Jai, I think we've gone over quite a lot now, so maybe we should come to a close. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like Angelica, Angelica's point. Uh, why would Srila Prabhupada empower Angelica so much if, if women were less intelligent? Look at Angelica. That's, that's the, you know, the example of Srila Prabhupada's mercy uh, and grace. And uh, yeah, Kishor Chandra Prabhu, beautiful class. Kishor Chandra Prabhu, what you did today is an example of Ahutuki Apratiyata. You didn't cancel your class even though you weren't feeling you know, well, that's the backbone. Srila Prabhupada is smiling. Srila Prabhupada is happy that the devotees are coming together. 
and glorifying Krishna, reading the Shastra, asking questions about contro controversial topics, handling those questions with uh, gravity. And, you know, I like how you point in people further to Jai Jagannath, to uh, Arjuna Prabhu. I want to know what, what he told you. I want to know, because uh, that's not the first time that I hear a testimony from a devotee who were pacified uh, by Arjuna Prabhu. I have another instance of that. He knows how to do that. So thank you very much, beautiful class. Dear devotees, thank you so much for uh, tuning in regularly, for keeping your cameras on, for keeping your cameras off, for asking pertinent questions, uh, for making comments. We love you all. Thank you so much. Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai, Radnat Maharaj Ki Jai, Kishor Chandra Prabhu Ki Jai, Hare Krishna. Have a beautiful day. Kishor Chandra Prabhu, we hope you feel